Hello everyone, today is Thursday, December 1st, 2016, and this is the week in charts. Of course, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. So what are we going to talk about? Well, obviously I want to continue talking about current market conditions, and the question is, will Trump make stocks great again? So we're going to have a lot of follow-up on that, especially when we get to the live charts, but I do want to recap on a few things that we talked about way back when was that oh nearly a month ago uh it was uh, there was thanksgiving then it was trades expo so this is a first show in a while uh anyway uh, your questions on trading obviously we'll get to those too uh ed if you don't mind keep your questions related to what's on the slides and then you can ask about anything you want when we get uh, towards the end of the slides uh once we get to the charts the live charts then you can start asking about individual stocks but if you don't mind ask about one stock at a time and that's for your benefit that's so I know whether or not I covered your stock you could ask about as many stocks as you want but if you ask about 10 of them I'll have to pick and choose a few of them and then go on to someone else and then I might forget where I was so just wanted to just punch a symbol in and hit return uh, what do we talk about this week well it's one of the secrets of trading that really isn't that big of a secret it's do nothing and make money and that'll make a lot more sense and then I want to recap a little bit on short-term versus longer-term trading. I've been doing a lot of presentations. I did one for Italy yesterday, and I did one for a, a third-party organization just recently. And I went back and, and realized that, okay, well, these people don't know who I am, or, or more importantly, they probably don't care who I am, but more importantly, my philosophy on things. So I want to just kind of touch upon that a little bit uh, for those who aren't fully familiar. And then I want to use some live examples on that. Uh, there's a disclaimer screen, and this is the way I sum it up. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Now, I want to do a little bit of a recap on the Trump thing. And as we talked about a few weeks back, you have to be very careful with big picture ideas. Logically, they make a lot of sense. But markets are often illogical. And then the other thing I'm seeing now, which is kind of interesting, is usually, and I'll talk a little bit more about this when we get the actual charts, but usually when something happens like a new presidency or some kind of event like that, there's some sort of big picture idea, and it initially gets a big pop, and then it's kind of like a one and done. But so far, we've had some pretty decent follow-through in the metal stocks and some other sectors based on the Trump rally. And we'll get to that in just one second. But you do have to be careful when you're trying to make some sort of a logical inference when it comes to some sort of uh, big picture news event like this. And it's very easy to, to become attached to your idea because it makes so much sense. And again, as I often preach ad nauseum, I should say, is that markets are often obviously logical and then rarely do things unfold exactly as planned so it, it's very difficult to come up with a big picture idea and follow along especially when it's something very obvious like the metals and mining stocks are going to do really well with the Trump presidency and they might just do well but as a trend follower what do we do we just follow along and we really don't care about why the whys will come in time so again, so far so good, uh, but again, markets can be illogical and reality might not always fit the perception. Now, this is something I talked about a few weeks back. I just want to recap on it. So what did gun stocks do during the tenure of the most anti-gun president in the history of the United States? So I put these slides together a few weeks back. And Ruger went up 800% and Smith & Wesson went up nearly 900%. So these gun stocks did really well. Hey, how'd that get in there? These gun stocks did incredibly well during the tenure of one of the most anti-gun presidents ever. So you would have thought when it looked like Obama was going to win or shortly after Obama won, just run out and short like crazy, short with both fists, all of these gun stocks. But in reality, just the opposite happened. So that's just a great... Uh, example of why you got to be careful if you confuse the issue with facts and I actually bought the domains do not confuse issue with facts 
and don't confuse the issue with facts, but no apostrophe in there. You can't have an apostrophe in a domain. All right, this is where I just want to take a few minutes and, and kind of back up a little bit and talk about my methodology because we have some live examples. And to those who are newer to the methodology, the live examples aren't going to make as much sense unless we do a little background information. So for you veterans here, which I know most of you are, uh, bear with me while we go through this. Now, I often talk about short-term versus longer-term trading. And you can only predict the short-term, but the money's in the long-term. So there's a big dilemma here. And then the dilemma gets even worse because the risk is in the longer-term trading, too. And as I often say, we read about all these famous traders, and I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus because bad things can happen to anyone, right? But we read about all these famous traders, and you think, man, it'd be great to be that guy. Well, if you do a little Googling, that guy subsequently blew up, okay? Not all the time, but in a lot of cases. And this happens with this longer-term trading. If you're just a pure longer-term trader, as I often say, and this is based on, on, on many years of mechanical research many years ago, I found that the longer-term trading, and it seems like other people have backed me up in this, you're only going to be right around 28% of the time. So nearly 80% of the time, or set, well, I guess it's 72%, but over three-quarters of the time, or nearly three-quarters of the time, you're going to be wrong. So not only are you going to be wrong a lot, which is okay to be wrong a lot, okay? Somebody asked me at a webinar yesterday, what's percent correct? I have no idea. But I'd rather make money than be right. But unfortunately, with the longer-term trading, the odds are so stacked against you, it's, it's very difficult to take on longer-term trades. You're also going to have to have very wide stops, and your drawdown is going to be absolutely abysmal. And that's why a lot of these guys subsequently blow up. They make a lot of money when, when the market is trending, when the sun is shining, they do really well. But when the market gets choppy and has sharp reversals, they do poorly. Not that I'm immune to that, but through my hybrid approach to the money and position management, it helps to kind of mitigate those bumps a little bit. Now, again, just to kind of recap on this, and, and I know you guys that have been around for a while, just bear with me for a second. When it comes to short-term trading, the advantage is you can only predict the short-term with a reasonable degree of accuracy. You can still be wrong, but, you can only, but you're going to be right a lot more than you will if you're trying to predict a longer-term trend. So, again, it's very difficult to predict a very long-term trend with any degree of accuracy. As I often say, it's, I, I stole a line from Greg Morris, and you just saw it a few minutes ago, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So when that stuff begins to happen, that's when things sort of deteriorate a little bit. So that's why it's tough to make these big picture, longer term predictions. People are often, often asking me, hey Dave, uh, what do you think about this as an investment, or or should I invest in this? And I, I, I refer to a column I wrote a while back where I said, there are no good longer term investments, okay? Now, it doesn't mean that I won't stick with a stock for a long, long time. When people say, what's your holding period? I say, hopefully 10 years, and even more hopefully 20 or 30 years, even longer. So when I get into a stock, I want to be in a stock forever. But another reality, it's not going to work out that often where I'm in a stock more than a few years. Now, if you're short-term trading, your risks are much better defined. And again, in longer-term trading, you're going to have much wider drawdowns because a market could move a lot more over a longer period of time. So if you're taking a short-term trade, you could have a little tiny stop if it's a really short-term trade. Or a swing trade, your stop might look like this. But if you're going to try to ride out a longer-term move, the longer you're in a position, the bigger the position can move. I often talk about the odds probability cone, which I don't actually use in my chart, but it makes this parabola that goes out like this and looks something like that. And what happens is the further out you forecast, the less certainty, certainty you're going to have. Again, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. 
Now, with short-term trading, the downside is your gains are going to be limited. Over a short period of time, if this is time, okay, in general, a market can only move so far. I mean, I know some crazy things happen every now and then, and I'll get to that in just one second. But only the market can only move a short amount, a reasonable amount. And then, obviously, longer term, a market can do whatever it wants and make a much bigger move. So the gains are potentially unlimited, okay, with the longer-term trading. Unfortunately, the longer you're in the market, the better the chance that something bad will happen. And sooner or later, it will. And that's one thing I can promise. But the other thing that I can also promise is bad things can still happen shorter term. I know day traders or know of day traders who have been wiped out by some very short-term moves that have happened okay and then also as a general statement if you're sh very short-term trading you tend to be a little bit over leveraged i don't want to get too far into that but that kind of helps you blow up <laughs> uh, but bad things can still happen so it leaves us with a dilemma short-term trading doesn't make enough and you can still screw up really badly and longer term trading makes money okay but it's very risky and accuracy is very low so the way I wrap my head around that is I do a little bit of both so someone once told me that I'm often picking on the reversion to the mean guys and the reason I pick on the reversion to the mean guys is because reversion to the bead says that you should just blindly buy a market because it's oversold but you have to remember oversold can often be more oversold now, more often than not, you do get a bounce from oversold, and that's why reversion to the mean trading has such a big, uh, I guess, allure, if that's a word, if that's the right word, because people think, oh, wow, this thing is like 80, 90% accurate, so I'm going to make money, make money, make money, make money. And a lot of these uh, people actually said, uh, it's, they actually call it an income-producing machine. And that's usually a reversion to the mean type of trade where you're taking little bitty tiny gains. But the true reversion to the mean people say don't use stops because it'll reverse. Well, you can get into a lot of trouble doing that. By the way, I happen to notice, and I shouldn't say this, but <laughs> I got diarrhea of the mouth today. Uh, I happen to notice where one of the more famous reversion to the mean guys is now a trend follower. So isn't that ironic, don't you think? Now, I'll probably need a better word for this right here. Oh, by the way, I'm, you know, I'm picking the reversion mean, guys. This is where I was going with this. And then um, back when I was more active in the TC group, which I might get active again in that. There's just not enough time in the day. But uh, one of the guys in there, a uh, local guy, engineer, good guy, uh, he pointed out that he's like, well, Dave, you're anti-reversion to the mean. And he's a reversion to the mean trader. But he does use stops. So I'll give him credit there. He says, but in reality, you're trading reversion to the mean. And we kind of went back and forth a little bit. He says, well, you were trading reversion to the mean within the established trend. And that's a fancy way of saying pullback. So the good thing is when a market is oversold and you've got a really solid trend behind you, it's possible that you're going to get a bounce back towards overbought. Now, I use the word fairly here. That's kind of vague. Uh, it's Nothing's guaranteed in the market. So I need to come up with a... Uh, better word than that maybe i need to put more more certain than this which is your longer term resumption of the trend so that's a big unknown again all predictions are about the future a lot of stuff can happen between now and then so i like to see it as changing hats i start off as a trader on every single trade and again there are no good longer term investments now, you could show me in hindsight maybe something that did really well over a long period of time. But chances are that it, it probably lost half its value somewhere during that time. I mean, look at real estate. Real estate has blown up a few times. Gold loses half of its value every now and then. The stock market loses half of its value every now and then. I mean, you would think that would never happen again, after, especially after like 1999. Well, 2000. 2001, what happened 2000 to 2003, I think, market lost 50% of its value. NASDAQ lost 70-something percent of its value 
during that time. I often give presentations where I show that. And then as recent as 2008, the market, overall market, the S&P 500 lost half its value. Well, that's a big deal, especially if you're thinking about retiring and then all of a sudden you lose half your money. If you've got $20 million and then you end up with only $10 million, that's okay. But if you saved up about a million dollars for retirement and you lose half of it, well, your lifestyle is going to be a lot different on a half a million dollars retirement as opposed to a million. So again, there are no good longer term investments, but I think that you can start off as a trader and end up as a trend follower or if you want to call it investor. OK, so again, trade with trade for small, quick gains, but be willing to stick with the position as long as it moves in your favor. And I think you truly can have your cake and eat it too. Now, this example is one of my favorite ones because there's so many things I'll discuss in here. I know I beat the dead horse on this particular chart, but we're going to get to some live ones in just one second. But the idea is, again, to get that small short-term gain out. In this particular case, we were looking for an 18% profit and then ride it out longer term. You exit half of your shares and then hold on to half for a longer term trend. And the good news is, if the trend materializes, you still have enough shares on to make good money. And if it doesn't, or when it ends in the end, your drawdowns are going to be somewhat mitigated because you've already reduced your risk and you're just giving up open profits. Uh, by the way, um, I like uh, Richard Dennis once said that he, or in one of the turtle books, I think it was written by Curtis Faith, and uh, interesting character, Curtis Faith. Uh, you could do some Googling on him and do some YouTubes. Uh, on him, but uh, it was, I think it was called The Way of the Turtle. I need to find it in my bookcase here. I don't see it right out, but I'm pretty sure it's it's uh, The Way of the Turtle, and I wasn't a big fan of reading these turtle books when they came out. In fact, that's the only one I, that I actually read until uh, Larry McMillan talked about the fact that it had a ping pong table in their office, and they were so bored waiting for trades that they started playing ping pong, and I thought that was pretty cool. Um, my wife would kill me, but I think it'd be fun, at least symbolically, to put a ping pong table in the back of my office. But that's another story. So we're looking to play that swing up to overbought. And if the trend doesn't materialize, at least we made something. That's what I call the better in the poke and eye trade. We're going to make 1%. We're going to risk 2%. And then we'll end up making 1% and get stopped out. Now, it doesn't take a rocket surgeon to realize that if you're risking 2% to make 1%, that's going to work until it don't, okay? You will make, it's kind of, it's almost like that, that anthill strategy I sort of alluded to a minute ago, where you're make a little, make a little, make a little, then you're losing twice as much as you're making. But at least you're making something. And keep in mind that if all you did was make 1% at a 2% risk, then sooner or later you would blow up or have the mother of all drawdowns. But the way you beat the negative expectancy or the perception of a negative expectancy, that's a fancy way of saying um, you are not making enough and risking too much. Okay, that's a, a mechanical system testers uh, buzzword. As uh, you occasionally capture the longer term trend and that's where the money is. But we scale out because we don't know if that trend is going to happen. And people often ask me, Dave, is your money management psychological or statistical? And my answer to that question is yes. It's statistical in that more often than not, the longer term trend doesn't unfold. So at least we're making something if we get that, that pop up to overbought. And sometimes noise alone can give us a profit. And it's statistical in that the longer term trend, when we do catch, I mean, that's where the money is, as we'll see in a few minutes when we get to the live portfolio. So the answer to that question is yes, it's statistical, but it's also psychological because we live in this microwave society where we're so used to getting everything. When's the last time you've seen a video store? I mean, there was one uh, in town that I remember that held on forever. And I, I figured it'd probably be a good place to go buy some crystal meth because how in the hell will they stay in business? It was some sort of, um, what do you call it, a front or something, because how could they stay in business in this day and age? Nobody wants to drive to the store and get a video. You get them instant download now, okay? 
So we do have this, this immediate need to be right, this immediate need for gratification. It's kind of like the Maslow's hierarchy of needs thing. I don't want to let freshman psychology rear its ugly head too much. But you're getting that short-term reinforcement, that short-term reward, okay, push a button, get a peanut type of reward. But you're also getting when you do occasionally capture that longer term trend, you're also feeding that, you're going up that ladder, right? And you're getting the more uh, ego, egotistical type of needs, that self-fulfillment, self-actualization. Again, I don't want to get too far in freshman psychology. But you're feeling better by capturing these bigger picture moves. Now, as we talked about in the last few presentations, there's two forms of patience. And we talked about the patience to wait for your pitch, and that's simply waiting until conditions are conducive for your methodology and waiting for decent setups. And as I often say, people crave action, and I would much rather someone, if I were to uh, have a protege or, or whatever, I would much rather someone with a lot of patience as opposed to someone who is incredibly intelligent because it does take a lot of patience especially when the market is just chopping sideways. In my trading service, sometimes I'll bore you to death. I'll bore my clients to death because I'm like, guys, I can't find anything to save my life. I don't think you should do anything. Here are a few things that I see. I'm not doing anything. But if you want to do something, knock yourself out. I recommend you don't. Now, the other patience is once you do find something, you have to let things unfold. And as I said in the last presentation or two, quoting Dr. J, who's a psychiatrist, we have no training to prepare us for sitting on our hands and waiting. It is simply not part of the mindset. And this was, uh, the, the email was a little bit longer. We talked about that about a month or so ago. And she was explaining to me, she was answering my question, because I put out a question the week before and said, hey, why is it that the most successful people and these highly trained, highly educated areas and these very successful people, why do they make the absolute worst traders? Why do they crave this action? Why do they trade? And I think the, the question was more phrased like, why do they trade in such mediocre conditions? Why do they accept this, this crap for setups, okay? And she was explaining to me that, well, because these, these people – in these industries, an automatic transmission mechanic or whatever, a doctor, lawyer, they take whatever train wreck is thrown at them. So they're used to dealing with this mediocrity. Whereas in trading, you, you have to be willing to push that aside and wait. If you're a doctor, you can't wait until you have someone who's easily curable or pick and choose who you want to uh, practice with. Okay, on or what's, what's the correct word? C, whatever you want to look at it. So she said, we have no training to prepare us for sitting on our hands and waiting, and it's simply not part of the mindset. So one of the secrets to trading is to understand that we're not made to trade. So in a case like a psychiatrist, you may have had 10, 20, 30 years of bad training, even though, even though you understand psychology, but you've had this bad training when it comes to trading. In the real world, the trading world, as I often preach, are two different worlds. Now, I don't want to digress too far into that. But the bottom line is, if you could be patient with the setup, and I talked a little bit about mind sculpting, and I've been reading that. Uh, I, I finally started reading that book. Uh, it's it's a good book um, so far. I recommend you do read it. I'm but I'm a big fan of these books that talk about the brain and how the brain works and understand the brain. I'm just kind of fascinated uh, with it. I know it's kind of nerdy. I even have a brain on my desk, which you'll be seeing uh, when I get get around to making that introduction. It, 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 yeah. Introduction video on trading. Introduction to trading video. And one thing we talked about a few weeks back was the mind sculpting. And uh, professional athletes are very good at this. If you ever see like an alpine skier uh, right before a, a run, if you notice, you can watch his head kind of moving back and forth. And you can see he's actually going through the motions of the run mentally. Um, I don't have the, the, the name of the, the author of the book in front of me, but he he talks a lot about this this mind sculpting where you mentally go through these things. And 
a great example that he gave was a was an athlete who broke his foot and instead of just sitting around playing Xbox for two or three weeks or however long it took to maybe longer, six weeks to recover, he actually mentally rehearsed his his routine in his head. And in fact, some athletes, as it says in the book, actually get to a point where they're so good at doing this that it actually they actually sweat and they actually feel the, the action. And one example he gave was a was a hurdle jumper who went through his routine routine and actually threw up because he worked out so hard in his mind that he actually felt it and, and it's like he just was so physically exhausted from that. So and that's a bit of an extreme example. I don't know how hard it is to get to a point where you're you're that involved. But the bottom line is, if you're willing to do a little bit of this mental rehearsal, and I don't want to go too crazy on you with neuroscience or whatever, but if you could do a little bit of this, your life is going to get a lot easier. And I try to say, say okay, I'm going to put this position on, and I want it to work, and I see it working and in my head, and I see what I'm going to do. Well, that's the easy part. The hard part is to see it not working, and in this particular case, Imagine getting into a trade and imagine being patient even though it's not working. And the patience once you're in a trade is really the biggest secret to trading that, that there is. Other than the biggest secret, I should say, first secret is that there is no secret. Now, it's hard for successful people because successful people are people of action. You didn't get to where you are by sitting on your ass. So... But in the markets, you often have to wait. And as I often say, there's always a reason to exit a trade and rarely a reason to stay. Now, I updated this example from a while back. But right around February, we got into this position. And it was a nice little bow tie set up uh, that came together. And it was coming off of all-time lows. Here's the bow tie here. It's also a first thrust. This move here, believe it or not, is 75% followed by this pullback. So it was a really cool looking setup. But by the time it got around the triggering, we might have been in the black for a little while, but all of a sudden we're faced with an immediate loss. The action, the people of action, the successful people of the world would probably want to exit because they're losing money. And the stock did rally up a little bit, but then became dead money by trading sideways. And it rallied up a little more. And then it became dead money again. And guess what? It went sideways for two straight months. You were underwater, still at a profit, but you gave up profits for two months straight. So again, that's a so-called dead money. Now, dead money is defined as an investment that has no chance of making money. Well, if you knew that an investment had no chance of making money, then why wouldn't you exit? And you would if you do, but you don't know, okay? So the idea is to let the market unfold, often by not doing anything. Now, again, there's always a reason to exit a stock, nearly always, and rarely a reason to stay. So this particular stock, notice that the bow ties begin crossing over. It sure looked like the stock move was done, and they were rolling over. Now, keep in mind that we start off as a swing trader, and we're taking profit somewhere in here for a nice little pop higher within a month or so. But we're also going to trail that stop. Let me just start over. We're also going to trail that stop higher and on a loose basis for hopefully what turns out to be a longer term move. So again, we had a reason to sell because it nearly bow tied down. And then again, it became dead money. And this time, if we're looking at peak to trough, okay. Let's look at the close right here. So this is the high close, the close on the high for July. And then all through August, it traded below that. And in September, it began to dive down. And then right around that time, 
we got a bow tie down. One of my clients said, hey, Dave, we got a bow tie sell signal. Don't you think we should exit? And I said, no. Why? Well, because the plan is to trail a stop higher and stick with that stop. And lo and behold, I'm like, aha, you see how smart I am? Look at that. It went up in a very persistent manner, and we're making all-time highs again. So don't you feel good about staying with the position? Well, whenever you get a little smug in the markets, what happens? You came back in. Okay? So now we have the mother of all dead money. One month, two month, three months, and a half. So three and a half months of dead money. So what do you do? Nothing. Now, right around this point here, I think, I don't know where this came from, but I think that somebody sent me an email saying it's not looking so hot. By the way, if you're on the trading service <laughs> and something's going down, I have a quote screen. You don't have to email me and say, hey, Dave, that stock sucks, because I know. <laughs> I feel your pain. <laughs> so, anyway, before I digress too far, I think somebody sent me this because I don't remember exactly what it was. And bad news, Lumen, I think that bad news was a, a potential uh, Hillary victory, or it was, it was in the bag, according to a lot of people. And then what happened? Well, you had the bow tie sell, a secondary bow tie sell. And then fast forward to yesterday. And it turned right back up. Moving averages turned back up. And then guess what? It closed at new multi-year highs. As I often say, either my wife does have a lot of confidence in me. And it's probably my own fault because, uh, I, you know, I kind of envy, some, not envy, but I'm, sometimes I, uh, I'm jealous of some of these, like, doctor friends of mine who, uh, who aren't mechanically inclined and actually end up fixing stuff for them, too. But, uh they don't have to deal with plumbing, electricity, uh, carpentry, and, and all these other things because they simply uh, they don't know how to do it. Well, I'm pretty handy. I, I, w I wasn't always that way, but I became handy over the years. And it's something that, don't tell my wife, but I kind of enjoy it a little bit or maybe more than a little. I do enjoy fixing things, but now when I have to, okay, I just I want to tinker when when I feel like it and not when I have to. But anyway, long story endless, I know too late. Chief Armin, where are you going with this? <laughs> uh, I do have a point. My wife often says if there's a plumbing problem or something, all you have to do is, you know, just tighten it up a little bit. It's all you have to do. And she kind of goats me into doing something that I don't feel like doing. And then, of course, if as anyone has ever plumbed, as it, just an example, uh, it always turns out to be a lot more than it appears on the surface. But, and I can hear my wife's voice in my head, all you have to do is, just wait and just let the trade unfold. But it's easier said than done because we are people of action. Now, getting back to the swing trade, swing to intermediate trade. I need to come up with a with a cliche. Swing to intermediate or swing to something. Swing to swing to invest. Swing. I need some kind of a cliche or something. Uh, if you give me a good one, I'll, I'll give you a gift certificate for my website. But something that, that exemplifies what we're doing, going for the swing trade and hanging around for the longer-term trade, it would have to be swing to something. Swing to question mark. Swing to intermediate is what I say for lack of a swing to hold. Eh, I don't know. That, might, that has a little ring to it. Uh, let me think about it. Anyway, uh, I don't want to go through too many details on this because we've done it quite a bit. But again, we're risking 2%. We're looking to make 1% on the first half and then some big number on the second half based on the entire portfolio. So you can see uh, in our swing trades in here, swing to success. That's eh, not bad. It's not bad. We're getting there. But on our trading part of the account, you see we're roughly making 1% on the account. I think this one had a dividend in it too, so it was a little bit better than that, uh, than with the numbers showing. And then we're going to stick around as long as the trend moves in our favor. Now, these aren't huge gains in here. I guess 115% is better than poking the eye on a trade, okay? 
but you can see that they have the potential to make a lot more than just one percent on the second loaf of the trade and if you look at these numbers here and you take them out of the total obviously without the big winners this total is going to be not that impressive and by the way uh, I don't want to digress too far but since we're looking at the portfolio when sometimes like in, and obviously we don't always have winners and there was a uh, loser or two uh, not too long ago that we have um, that I had to book but a lot of times people will call me up, hey, Dave, I'm going to quit. I can't make any money. It's like, well, geez, this is the best we've done in a long time, and I've been working hard to do this well, and these great times don't come along every day, and they're like, oh, well, I can't make any money. It's like, okay, well, let's take a look at things. Did you did you get CNX? No, I didn't get that one. You know, I didn't take that one. You know, It's like, <laughs> okay, uh, did you get Novin? No, I didn't take that one. Did you get SXCP? Well, I took it, but I exited it when it was losing money, so it's like, they either micromanage themselves out of the winners or they don't take them to begin with. They pick and choose, uh, as Greg uh, Borgeline from my buddy Greg Morris, it's like uh, they sharpshoot the signals. And, of course, they took the last three stinkers that we had, and that's why they lose money. But I digress. The, the point I'm trying to make is the real money is going to be in that outlier of a trade. And right now we've got three nice winners, and that's not always the case. I wish it was. But that's not always the case. Sometimes you just usually, or usually, if, you, if you're lucky enough, you, you have one big winner, and then the rest are kind of mediocre, which sometimes they have potential, and sometimes they don't stop out. And we let the portfolio stop us out of the stinkers, often by not doing anything, and stay with the winners by not doing anything, okay, and trailing that stop higher. So let's take a look at the other positions, the other winners in there. Uh, this was Novin, or still is Novin, I guess, which is a uh, biotech. And it had a bit of a deep IPO retracement. I just call it a hot public offering. Um, not enough time to get into this particular pattern. But it is in the IPO course, by the way. I need to put that on sale. You know, it's amazing that the IPO is just this bull market. This energizer bull market in the IPOs is just absolutely amazing. And the, the cool thing that's happened in IPOs is that as the, as the bull market began to deteriorate recently, the dichotomy between the stinkers and the winners became phenomenal. As I said in the course, and then I also talked about this in the free video. If you go to the IPO page, I think it's DaveLandry.com. I'm not soft selling. I will in a minute, though. It's not beneath me. Trade IPOs. There's a video there where I talk about trade IPOs. There's a video there where I talk about the dichotomy. I call it the fly and the die. A lot of times these things come public and they die, and a lot of times they come public and they fly. And what's amazing is the dichotomy has been really amazing in more recent times and then now it's like the bull market is kicking back in and people who got on a trading service within the last year or so I was like man this guy just trades a bunch of IPOs it's like well it all depends on what's what's working now I'm, I'm a big fan of church of what's happening now not that I'm going to change methodologies from methodology to methodology but I'm going to stick with whatever sectors are working okay so here's a setup and look at this this is let's say roughly two months of what dead money okay bore you to death and then even he had a little shakeout move here I was thinking right before I started my show this little shakeout move is pretty typical of a market a market will often do what it has to do to frustrate the most and in this particular case it had a big shakeout move it will also do and I borrowed these from Linda Rasky it'll also It'll also do the most obvious thing in the most unobvious manner. So if it's going to head higher, it's going to have a big shakeout move first, or often will. And I'm sure a lot of people bailed out on that move, but the stop wasn't hit. So for nearly two months, roughly, you had dead money with this position. And why would you stay with it? Well, you would stay with it because you're following the plan. I know. All you have to do... Easier said than done. So after dying out for a while, 
it's kind of trading sideways and shaking out, it takes off again and it just barely hit that initial profit target. So we take partial profits and we trail a stop higher. Here's SXCP and this is a great example here. Nice little double top knockout move, cool little setup, triggers an entry and what happens? It absolutely dies. There was a dividend in here but not enough to make up for this big nasty slide and it came dangerously close to the stop. Well, why not just bail out? Well, follow the plan. So immediately or nearly immediately you're bummed out because you have a losing trade and you think it's dead money, not only dead money, but dying money, okay, getting even worse. And then what happens? Well, it starts to rally a little bit, but then it becomes dead money again for nearly two months, okay? Do you bail out? No, just follow the plan. And then we were able to take partial profits and now we're trailing a stop higher. So again, the secret to trading is often doing nothing. And it's amazing how simple that is. Um, Dr. T is one of my favorite clients and not because he's a great guy and gregarious and a lot of fun uh, and I just really enjoy talking with him often, but because he often epitomizes the psychological struggles that we all go through. I am not immune, okay? I am not holier than thou. I deal with the same, and I hate to use the word demons, but the same psychological demons or issues that everyone else does. I've just learned to say, oh, I'm doing that psychological thing. I'm, 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 I want to micromanage myself out of this trade. I recognize that I'm getting ready to do that, so I'm not going to do that. And Dr. T is still a little bit early in his journey. He's been trading for a long time. He's very smart, and that's probably why he has a hard time trading. But he told me yesterday, he goes, you know, my trading has recently gotten a lot better. So you're instantly thinking that, well, Dr. T must have had some sort of epiphany that made his trading much better. He must have discovered some new pattern or he's, what happened? Something must have happened. Well, you know what happened? One of his doctors that worked for him quit. So now he's literally working day and night. Now, as I often preach ad nauseum, in fact, with my methodology, busy traders make good traders, okay? They trade when an opportunity presents themselves, but they're so busy that they only have time to trade when an opportunity presents itself. And in the meantime, they go off, they save lives, they build buildings, and they do other great things. When I travel, I tend to, on my way to Vegas, my last trip there, I spent the whole flight making a to-do to list. I keep myself crazy busy, okay? And if I do take a break during the day, I'll actually find myself in the garage tinkering or working on something or trying to not necessarily invent something, but fix something or sometimes invent something, okay? Uh, but I keep myself really busy and I have so many projects I don't want to do that I just can't get around to doing them. You know, it's like a friend of mine, uh, when I first met him, he came over one day and he was looking at all the different things I'm working on. He's like, Jesus Christ, you got some projects around here. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, I do. And I just, it's just my mindset. I have this, uh, as I often say, it's a, it's a bit of a sickness. I can't sit still and I've done some things to get healthier recently and it's even worse now that I'm healthier okay it's kind of like a dilemma here not a dilemma but um, what's the word I'm looking for anyway the point I'm trying to make is I know myself and if I'm watching the screen all day I will be trading I will be day trading I will be micromanaging I will be doing all these things that I preach against doing so I keep myself incredibly busy on purpose I do webinars, like I said, I did a webinar yesterday for Italy. I'm doing a webinar for somebody else in a few months, in a few weeks. Uh, I travel, I'm always working on slides, I'm working on courses, and I spend hours doing analysis every day. I do anything, or try to do anything, but watch the screen. So, as I often say, busy traders make good traders, and from a psychological perspective, if you have a sickness like me where you have to always do something, then 
embrace that and say, okay, that's great when it comes to fixing things around the house or tinkering or, or, or possibly working on something productive business-wise, but it could be a really bad hindrance when it comes to trading. So embrace who you are and what you are and make sure that does not negatively affect your trading. All right. I know I'm wound up today. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm still working on the beginner's course. This thing has been, you know, I looked at some of my examples. I have, I have examples from 2015 that were live examples at the time. I'm like, good Lord. I never thought a beginner's course would, would take so much time. But all these psychological things that you're hearing now, these basic psychological things, have found their way into the course. And it's like I keep feeling like I've got to tell them this. I've got to tell them this. So it's, I think it's going to be, I don't want to say, I, I kind of feel like it's my masterpiece. I know that's egotistical to say that. But I think it's going to be something where, and, and I don't think a more seasoned trade, trader or a veteran trader would go back and actually watch it. But in many cases, they should. And that's kind of the approach I took with it. Like someone like Dr. T, if he's struggling, or when he's struggling, I should say, if he went back and watched that course and actually did what I say to do, just little things like I just said, like keep yourself busy, embrace who you are, then I think he'd be very successful or more consistently successful, I should say. So anyway, so I'm doing that. Uh, by the way, make sure you're on a delayed trading service. Um, I actually had a client that that recently signed up for my live service because he was actually making money off of delayed stocks. So uh, check that out. It's free if you go to my website and you go to somewhere on the home page, I think. If you go here to Let's Get Started, and I give you a list of 10 things that you should do. And by the way, we got the agreement back up with TC2000. So uh, if you click on this, uh, it would help. It, it helps to pay for the website and stuff uh, if you get your TC through them. But somewhere down here, buried here, number nine, follow along for free, okay? It's foresight in hindsight. It's delayed approximately one week. Sometimes it's only a couple days, depending on live setup. Sometimes it's even longer. Like if we have a setup that doesn't trigger for a week, then I can't put last week's uh, service up because it's still live. But uh, do check that out. And uh, there might be a limited availability on this because uh, there's only so many people I can I can let in. But right now, it doesn't seem to be a huge problem. But eventually, I might actually have to uh, knock some people off after a few months. So just kind of warn you about that. But now would be a good time to get in on that. And you get to see everything that I talk about. And that way, you're not seeing this portfolio in perfect hindsight. That's why I call it foresight and hindsight, so you can actually see it, OK? Oh, Donald says, I'm in this one thanks to your IPO course. Well, thank you, Donald. Swing to bling. I like that, Jim. That's pretty good. <laughs> oh, man. Swing to stay. Swing to park. I'm going to have to write these down. Okay. Uh, where are we? I think we're almost done here. Thanks for your patience today, especially you uh, people who are familiar with all this. And you people who, you know, if you're already patient doing all this, then congratulations. But if you're not... And that's a thing, too. It's like, um, I, I know I tell this over and over again, but I asked my wife, hey, did you read McCollum? She's like, yeah. I said, what do you think? She goes, well, you say a lot of the same shit. <laughs> I'm like, that's right, baby. And I'm going to keep saying the same shit until you people get it. So this, sit, in, sit on your hands and be patient. I'm going to keep saying that. Why? Because every time, every time we get into a position that just goes sideways, my inbox fills up. Hey, Dave. This is dead money. Should we get out? Like, no. Follow the plan. So that's why, in case you're wondering, that's why I beat the dead horse so much. Now, let's hop back into the stocks, uh, into the live charts. And if you want to start asking about individual uh, stocks, start now. I'm going to cover the overall market, some sector action, and then we'll pop into your uh, stock question. So the question is, will Trump be good for stocks? And again, I, I almost stopped short of talking about this again, but because you have to be careful about these big picture ideas. But the good news is, so far, 
it's worked out fairly nicely. And let's take a look at some of these things in here. Uh, first of all, let's take a look at the P's. S&P 500, a little bit of a corrective mode here. No big whoop. I wouldn't get too excited just yet. My only concern, and this goes for all the indices, is that when you have a V-shaped recovery at high levels, it's very hard for the market to sustain that. And the reason is, by the time you get all the way back up to the prior highs, the market's already overbought and due to correct. And that's how a lot of uh, double tops form. Uh, one thing, I mean, you know, there's always something to worry about. If you must worry about something, one thing to worry about or think about is uh, if you study classical technical analysis, they'll show these perfect little double tops. But in reality, it never unfolds like that. And that's why you have to do read all the books, uh, Schaubacher and uh, Edwards and McGee and Pring. Uh, read all these books on technical analysis. But then use it a little sparingly until you get a feel for how it actually works. And then also I would strongly urge you to combine specific setups within that technical analysis. So a lot of times we'll have a big picture, coupled hand or double bottom or saucer bottom, and then you have a bow tie or a first thrust or something like that. So use your general technical analysis sparingly until you get a good feel for it and until you actually have actual setups. But sometimes a double top, my point is that it rarely unfolds as perfectly as it does in those textbooks, okay? But sometimes a double top will overshoot the prior high, fake everybody in, make them think that everything's okay, and then come right back in. Now, let's not anticipate that, and I hate to use the word hope. Let's hope that's not what's going on here. But what we need to do is pay attention and see if this market comes back into this trading range. If it does, don't rush out and sell the form. Don't exit any positions that you're already in because the market's deteriorating a little bit or appears to be deteriorating. Just honor your stops, but do become selective on new positions. And as I often preach, and here I go again, something new or something, uh, again, beating a dead horse. If we do come down to, say, 2150 or so, then we say, well, you know what? This market's going sideways again on a net-net basis. Where are we now? Where are we a few months ago? Okay then you might just want to sit on your hands. And again, there's that patience thing rearing its ugly head. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. Now, the NASDAQ scores as a bit of a bummer. It, too, had that V-shaped recovery, but unfortunately, it's pulling back into this prior range. Now, am I freaking out just yet? Not just yet, okay? So this is that double top overshoot thing that we talked about just a minute. It overshoots the prior peak, making you think that everything's okay, and then comes back in. So this has got me a little concerned. Let's just see how the day unfolds, the next few days unfold. Sometimes, as I said in the market in a minute, you have a market takes off, comes back in, retests the, the uh, prior base, and then takes off again. And this particular case, it's now back into the base, okay? So we do need to start paying attention to that aforementioned net, net thing. So if we take a measurement off of this, you can see that we're pretty flat in here on a net, net basis. It should be closed right around this area. So we need to keep a, an eye on this NASDAQ composite. And if it stays in this range for a while or drops further into the range, then we might want to pull in our horns a little bit, at least in technology in general. As you know, NASDAQ is very uh, strong uh, technology uh, base. Okay. Now, the good news is the Russell 2000 looks the best out of all of the indices. If I, I used to date a little country girl, and she said, if I had my rathers, so if I had my rathers, I would say that uh, I'd rather the Russell do great and not worry so much about the other indices. Unfortunately, if the other indices deteriorate eventually, they'll pull down the Russell with it, or more than likely pull it down. But so far, Russell looks pretty good. Still overbought in here, correcting from overbought. But as a small cap trader, as a general statement, I tend to be a small cap trader. But again, church of, what happening, church of what's happening now, the energy stocks, which are 
higher capitalized, such as CNX. See, what's it, what's the average volume in CNX? Uh, oh, it's not as big as I thought it was. Where's the average volume? Oh, it's pretty big. Yeah, uh, zero zero. What's that? Four million. That's pretty. That's pretty thick stock. So I will trade a thicker stock when the opportunity presents itself. But as a general statement, we do tend to trade these smaller cap issues, okay? So, so far so good in the Russell 2000. Let's take a look at the energy stocks. They came right back in, okay, look, break out, fake out, and then they take off. This is just typical for a market to fake out and frustrate as many as possible and then take off, okay? First breakout was a false one. Our first couple of breakouts were false ones. But so far, so good. And that's led higher. All of a sudden, uh, oil is getting a pretty serious bid. In fact, over the last couple of days, 14% rise in oil in just a couple of days. So you can see that the energies are coming back with a vengeance. So I think we could see some setups in energy soon. Now, metals of mining came right back into their little uh, consolidation, whatever you want to call this. And they did break out a couple of days ago, a few days ago, but I think that was just mainly because of gold and silver were bouncing. But if you take a look within the sector, steel, copper, aluminium, all look pretty good. So far, they look pretty good. Industrial metals and mining also looks pretty good too. And silver continues to lag, as does gold. Let's take a look at gold, the commodity. <laughs> Actually, somebody wanted to go, Dave, can I buy, should I buy a goal? I'm like, can you draw an arrow? It's like, well, there I go back to beating a dead horse again. Every time I try to stop beating a dead horse, y'all pull me right back in. <laughs> no, no, draw your arrows, okay? If you can't draw an arrow, do the net net change and then just uh, use your C key and telechart. And by the way, I... Strongly urge you get Telechart. Uh, I do use other charting packages such as StockCharts.com and MetaStock for different reasons and other, other things. But as far as my general stock analysis, I do nearly everything in uh, Telechart. I think, I think there's room for more than one charting package because one charting package doesn't do everything. But as far as my style of trading with stocks, uh, I do nearly everything in TC. And it's cheap. It's really cheap, especially if you get on like a delayed service. So I'd urge you to get that. Uh, use the banner ad on my website, which is under the getting started, if you do. So I'll get credit, and that'll help pay for the website, pay for these webinars, whatever. Anyway, you can see gold is in a pretty serious slide. You don't have to be a rocket surgeon to see that. Just draw some lines on your chart, okay? And silver is the same thing. What's silver? SLV. Same sort of action in silver, uh, just not looking so hot. So no, you don't want to rush out and buy these areas, okay? What else is happening? Some areas like foods, not so hot. We had a couple of stocks set up here as potential shorts. I didn't take them. Uh, you know, in hindsight, I guess it was like, well, maybe we should have, but you could see, uh, and the reason was it just seemed like, just didn't seem like there was a huge opportunity there, but in hindsight, some of these areas, uh, these stocks that were recently on the Landry list uh, began to implode, so that's concerning. One of the, speaking of big cap stocks, one of the things that's concerning is um, Facebook. Somebody asked me last week, or last week, two weeks ago, way back here, should I buy Facebook? I'm like, no, you got to gap down after all-time highs. That's what I call reversal gap strategy. Uh, also a first thrust, and I'm sure it's a bow tie too. Uh, it's invisible bow tie. Yeah, here's your bow tie right there. Okay. Let's fix this chart while I'm here. So no, uh, but the point I'm trying to make here, believe it or not, I do have one, is that some of these uh, big stocks such as Facebook and Amazon are not looking so hot, okay? And you can see that Amazon is bow tied down. I think that's all time highs. If not, it should be. Yeah, that's all time highs, okay? So when you get a bow tie down of all time highs, it usually pays to pay attention. Okay, write that down. But so far, Amazon not doing so hot in here. Now, I'm not going to get too excited because Facebook and Amazon are headed lower. That might be just uh, old economy. It's kind of funny to call uh, Amazon old economy, but economy, but um, old economic cycle, I should probably say. 
versus new economic cycle. Maybe the new economic cycle where we're building the wall, we're going to need more of these, uh, we're going to need bricks and mortar. So these brick and mortar stocks, uh, I'm kind of making a play on words here, but are going to be doing well. So if you take a look at like the banks, banks have been doing fairly well in here. In fact, in spite of the market being a little soft today, banks are actually banging out new highs, as you can see. So we, we are seeing setups here. I can't show you which ones. Um, well, we got one uh, working now. But if you look within the banks, you'll see, uh, you'll, you'll start seeing some setups there. Insurance banking out new highs. So financials in general, what's financials? XLK, I believe. No, nope, that's technology. Technology not doing so hot, huh? But uh, XLF? Oh, there we go. Yeah, there's the financial. It's a little banging out new highs in here, okay? So the financials are doing really well. And then technology looks like it's lagging a little bit. Obviously, NASDAQ's coming in today, so... We just have this big, vicious sector rotation, and maybe it's on the promise of this new administration. Maybe not, but so far, it has uh, worked out. Now, retail has been pretty weak in here. As you can see, I have an arrow down. The good news is it has rallied back up, but now it's beginning to weaken a little bit again. So uh, this is a little bit concerning, the fact that it's weakening here. I was encouraged by the fact that it was turning back up, and now it's beginning to weaken. So. I would be, as usual, I would be very selective, and it seems like these old school areas, like the banks, transports, uh, and cyclical areas like metals and mining, sands, gold, and silver, are doing really well. And some of these newer economy stocks, so to speak, haven't been doing so hot. Now, semiconductors are one exception today notwithstanding. But the semiconductors have been doing really well in here. And then we get this knockout move today. So we'll see what happens. But tonight we should see some semiconductor setting. It looks like I'm going to have a long night tonight because with this nice little breakout here and this pullback, we should see some nice TKOs in areas like the semis. By the way, speaking of TKO, um, get the TKO video off my website. You have to get through a third party. I know it's kind of a pain in the butt. But... Uh, you will eventually get to the video. So check that out if you get a chance. Um, and it's I'm proud of it. It's something I work really hard on. But there's a really good TKO video that I did. And it's right now. You can get it today off the website. Uh, and then longer term, or somewhat longer term, I should say, you could also get it. Uh, you can go to the archives and get it. Let me show you where it is. Today it's right here. But this banner ad will probably come down later today or tonight. But you can get it right here uh, somewhere in the latest content. And then if it's not a week or two or three or a month from now, you're not seeing this, you could, you could simply go uh, down here for the more posts. But, yeah, do check, out the web, the, do, do check out the video there. I know they make you jump through some hoops, and that's, that tends to happen when you submit content to a third party. But uh, trust me, I think it's really good, and I think it's worth your while. Anyway, watch the video, and then pay attention to semiconductors, uh, metals and mining, specifically steel, copper, aluminium, and look for those trend knockouts there, and also the industrial uh, metals. Okay. Sam says, are those trend lines 10, 20, 30 EMA or SMA? Um, those are the bow ties, and I'm using a, we got time. Well, I don't, I'm not going to bring it up today. It's, we might not have time. I'm using a 30-day um, a, a exponential a 20-day exponential, and a 10-day simple, okay? Let's see if I have I might have it here quickly. Let me see if I can pull that up from the intro course. Uh, feel free to start asking questions about uh, stocks in general or any particular issues you want me to talk about. Let's see if I can find it here. Oops. And then we'll get to those stocks in just one second. But uh, that pretty much any questions on the sector action or the overall stock market action while I'm looking for this, um, for something I could show you real quick on that. You're welcome, Sam. And then if I get a chance, let me just see if I could show you real quick. Yeah, here it is. This is straight from my introduction course. And if you come down, let me see if I can find it 
for you. So if you come down to the moving average uh, section of the course, one thing that I pointed out, which is really cool, I learned this from Greg Morris. Greg's an ex-engineer, I believe. And um, he pointed out that the moving average will turn on an exponential moving average as soon as the price crosses above it. So these are my bow tie moving averages, a 10-day simple, 20-day exponential, and a 30-day exponential. Notice that price crosses above the 10-day moving average here, but the 10-day moving average is still headed lower, okay? Now notice that here, price crosses above the 20-day EMA, and then notice that the 20-day EMA turns up while the 10 is still headed lower. Now you might be wondering, why do I use a 10-day moving average? And the reason I do that is because I'd like to see a true representation of price over the last couple of weeks. But as I go further out, I want those moving averages front rated. So you can see that even it's not much, but you can see this moving average actually turn when the price closes above it. You can see the 30-day moving average. Now it doesn't look like it, but again, if you zoom in, you can see that it just barely ticked up. So it will turn really quick. And that's because it front weights the data. And this is just a graphic on bow ties, 10-day simple, 20-day exponential, 30-day exponential. We're looking for them to come together over a short period of time and then spread out. And again, the 10 is two weeks true average. I just like a two, a smooth, um, I'm sorry, a smooth, a uh, simple moving average for that. And then, again, I'm not going to do a whole bow tie presentation because they're out there. And Go to free reports on my website and pick up the bow tie report. But we're looking for them to come together over a short period of time. Then we're looking for a one little bar pullback. Okay, Go in and look at that CNX example. And that was a good uh, recent bow tie that worked out really nicely. And then get the free reports. Okay, you're welcome, Sam. Yeah, th those, those are moving averages. Uh, you said trend lines, uh, moving averages. All right, Donna wants to know about MSCC, MSCC. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Put that on your watch list. Um, it looks pretty darn good. I would like to see a little bit more knockout move, but as I said a minute ago, we'll probably see a lot of knockouts, okay? Um, it took off on a gap, and then it continued higher. So, yeah, absolutely. That needs to be on your watch list. Again, I'd like to see a little bit more knockout move, so let's see where it is tonight, but absolutely. Yeah, no worries. Uh, I, I, I figured what, I knew what you meant. Uh, CWH for Mr. Brett, CWH. Yeah, uh, put this in your watch list, but it's not set up just yet, okay? You want to wait for a pullback or ideally like a TKO. Like if this thing shot down to like 25 to knock out some people. And again, watch that video on TKOs, and I think you'll... Uh, I think you'll like it. Uh, do me a favor, watch it, and then uh, get back to me on that, and let me know what you think. Okay, ELF, another Brett pick, ELF. Yeah, I mean, you, you're uh, you're all over these IPOs. I see where you're going with this. Uh, yeah, but let's see what happens. Ideally, in this particular case, I'd like to see some upside follow-through, maybe like this, and then and then look for a pullback. But that needs to be certainly on your watch list, absolutely. I have it on uh, my watch list. RG says, V, where would you enter? Probably I would not. Let's see. Uh, no, this would be a short, if anything. Uh, notice that it's rolled over in here. Let's uh, throw the bow tie moving averages in. Lo and behold, we have a bow tie in here. Let's see, we've got a weekly bow tie. You're coming up on a weekly bow tie, so this could be the mother of all trends. Um, I'm hoping, if you're, if you're familiar with the methodology, I'm hoping you're thinking about shorting this and not buying it, okay? Uh, because as a trend follower, we want to be shorting something like this. So where would you short it? Yeah, wait for a bounce. It was set up here. Wait for the next bounce and look to short it. It's kind of interesting because financials are doing well, but uh, Visa, not so much. Okay. Swing to success. I might think, oh, it's not bad. Swing to bling. FHB. FHB. Um. Yeah, this one looks uh, interesting here. 
I would have liked to seen a little bit more knockout move, but it's 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 not bad. Okay, you got a nice thrust higher out of a base, a little pullback. It's an IPO, so there's there's some excitement there. A little on the thin side, so be careful. But absolutely, that looks pretty darn good. Uh, nice eye on that one. I think that was Brett again. Good picks. Uh, yeah, this looks interesting. I've been watching this one. Uh, nice persistent move higher. Yeah, it's like I don't want to confuse the issue with facts. It's like this little stupid vacuum cleaner that everyone I know has one tells me how it's always broken. Uh, so it's kind of like it's hard for me to rush out and buy the stock, but maybe somebody likes theirs, you know. Uh, and I know the wife wants one. Uh, but, yeah, this looks pretty good, maybe on a pullback in here. So I, I won't if it does pull back and set up, uh, I won't confuse the issue with facts, and I'll just go after it. Also, it could be maybe a, um, a TKO would be a great thing to look for in that. TR, TN, TR, TN. Um, th the problem with this one is it kind of just went straight up from these low levels, and it looks it's already overbought. And the other problem is uh, two other problems. One, it's kind of wide and loose longer term. Let's see. Yeah, it's kind of electric cardiogram longer term. And but it needs to correct a little more. If it corrects a little more, then you're back to this breakout. So I think I would pass on that one, just uh, mainly because it's wide and loose longer term. I see where you're coming from, though. I can't beat you up too much on that. S N D. I think that was John asked for that one. Um, yeah, this is kind of interesting. Uh, on a pullback, absolutely. This is a metal and mining stock. Um, to those of you who are familiar with the IPO course, it would have been a buy right there. So it's a good little uh, good little stock so far on a pullback. Yes, absolutely. NAK for Andre. NAK. NAK. Yeah, this one looks okay. Um, it's one I've looked at recently. It, it did kind of pull back to its prior little uh, peak in here. Uh, but it looks okay. The volatility a little crazy, though. I think it would pass just because you don't have an extreme amount of structure in the way the volatility is, is shaken up is uh, shaping up it's kind of extreme it's okay I mean I can't again I can't beat you up too much on it but it's just so volatile and kind of all over the place that I think it's just too dangerous to go after but I hear you uh, if you did trade it uh, you know just use a dollar 17 stop you know so PIR that's gonna be what pier one uh, yeah that looks pretty good uh, let's back to chart out a little bit I'm not super excited about buying retail at this juncture, uh, but I certainly hear you. A little bit of overhead supply to contend with, not a tremendous amount, but I might that might kind of hold me back on this one. But I hear you. You got the big double bottom. Remember we said earlier, don't trade off a double bottom, but use it within a setup. Uh, kind of cup and handily looking. Also, lo and behold, there's your bow tie. So I'm going to give you okay on that one. I personally think I would pass because of this little bit of overhead supply, but maybe I'm being a little bit of a perfectionist in, in looking for the perfect chart pattern. And I'm also not really excited about retail right now. But I, I will have to say a uh, good eye on that one and that it's it's not bad. And certainly if you're just looking at it over here, it looks pretty darn good, especially since you're coming off of all-time lows. Let's see if there's all-time lows. My wife got a gift certificate recently to Pier 1. There's nothing, you know, it's like, uh, what's the old saying? There's nothing more expensive than a free boat or a free dog. She got a gift certificate, <laughs> and she didn't want anything for for less than the price of the gift certificate, so she ended up spending a lot of money, <laughs> about 10 times what the gift certificate was, but that's another story. She's really not bad when it comes to shopping. It's just... She often, but unfortunately, she'll wake up and, I think I want new floors today. I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> uh, it's a good thing she doesn't come to these webinars. Yes, this UCTT looks good. Uh, again, this is another one of those semiconductors. I'm going to be all over these tonight. Uh, now that we have a little correction going on in the semis, you'll likely see a couple of these, or not a couple, but you'll likely see one of these in the service, depending on how they set up. Uh, i like to see a little bit more knockout move than what we've seen here. But, yes, put that on your radar. High five. Good pick.
say it's like uh, I, I lost a potential client because he said, uh, I come to your shows and you hate all my stocks. It's like, well, no, I hate my own stocks too because the market's been chopping sideways. But now that we've got a little trend underway, I'm liking more and more. Uh, STL, I think I would pass on this one just because it, it pulled back, shot up, and now it's just kind of consolidating in here. For me to get excited, maybe a knockout move and I'll reevaluate. Maybe it look like a double top knockout, but I think I would pass on this one. There's just too many other banks in there that are trending uh, that I would look for. When's a good time to add a stock like CNX? Okay, uh, add on trades. The stock must be set up in and of itself as a standalone setup. So let's get a uh, let's get a blank screen in here, and let me show you that. Uh, if you do a, uh, by the way, there's a plethora of weekend charts out there on YouTube. And if you can't sleep at night, um, please check them out. And in some of those, you're going to see a lot of things like swing trading around the longer term positions. And But the bottom line is, the answer to that is, it must be set up again as a standalone setup. So it, it's funny. Sometimes I'm doing my scans and... Um, or going through my 2,000 stocks nightly, whatever it is, and I'll see a stock set up, and I'll get all excited, and I realize, hey, we're really long that. So that's a litmus test. So let's say you get long a stock. Let's just use 200 shares to make the math easy. So you're plus 200 shares here, and then we're going to exit 100 here, okay, at that initial profit target. So we still have 100 shares on. Now, if that stock does a nice little TKO, or does some sort of pullback up here, then what you would do is you would put back on 100 shares. Now, I don't do this in my trading service, but I will personally do this, okay? And the reason I don't do it in a trading service is I think it could end up being a nightmare for me. The results would look much, much better, okay? But I think it would be a nightmare to try to explain to everybody we're doing an add-on and, and just would... but. A lot of my clients email me and say, Dave, what do you think? And, and, I, and I'll give them a thumbs up or thumbs down. But what I've done in more recent times, since more and more people, my, my clientele is getting smarter and smarter, which is kind of exciting for me. Uh, so it's not as much of a revolving door as it used to be. And in them, in them getting smarter, I'm getting more and more people that are swing trading around the positions. So what I do now is I'll point out in the service like, okay, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. This one is set up again for those of you who want to do add-ons. And then you just treat it like a new swing trade. So put on 100, and then when it gets up to that new profit target, flip out 100, okay? But you still have that core position working here. And this is one great way to beat the system. So again, if it was a standalone setup, if you were just seeing the setup, even though you're already long, if you were just seeing that setup, that's a litmus test, then by all means, you want to do an add-on. So you were asking about CNX which we are long, so let's take a look at that. Wait, it's not set up right now, okay? Oops. So for me to get excited about CNX, it would have to continue to break out, okay? And then we would do what? We'd play the first little pullback as an add-on trade. So right now, it's just beginning to peep out a little bit. It hasn't cleared it quite yet. One thing I like about this, I like stocks that bore me to death longer term because that means they're just creeping higher and that growth is sustainable. We've had, like, what was it, air gain or something recently. I mean, that's all exciting when they take off. A I R G, but they often come right back in. Like, this was phenomenal. Like, wow, yay, this is very exciting. And then pff, they come right back in. Whereas something like the CNX, that longer term, that longer term creeping higher bores you to death, but hey, you know, from there to there, that's a hundred and something percent. You know, that's better than the poke in the eye. I'll take that any day of the week. Okay. You did that on every trade or every other trade or every fifth or sixth or seventh or even tenth trade, you don't in the world pretty quickly. Okay, we talked about that one. Uh Brett, yeah, that's a that's an IPO. Brett's all over these IPOs. You must have the course. Thank you. If you do. Um, yeah, it needs a little bit more pullback, but yeah, that's interesting. You've got a little breakout pattern back here that uh, was fulfilled uh, around about 18.25, and then now the next pullback. It's a secondary pattern is what I call that. Uh, Donna wants to talk about TCK, which is going to be a metals and mining stock. I think. Yeah, there it is. 
Yeah, a little bit more pullback. This is one that needs to go on your momentum list. My momentum list is getting bigger and bigger. In fact, I actually had to work on it yesterday because it was getting so big. Uh, and call out a few, but uh, absolutely, this needs to go into your momentum list. Yeah, Dennis, absolutely. And and if you feel like uh, Dennis says, uh, I'll listen for your wink, wink, nudge, nudge in the service. Yeah, and if you ever feel like uh, you think something might be set up, but again, I'll tell you if it is. But if you think it's getting close, ask me, and I'll coach you a little bit on that. I'd be happy to do that. But yeah, if it's officially set up, I promise you I will point that out. Q, QTNA, never heard of it. Quintina, Quantino communication. Yeah, this looks pretty good. Tiny bit more pullback, uh, but it needs a tiny bit more pullback, maybe to about 17, but that looks good. It's like, you know... People come to these shows when the market's choppy, like, oh, man, he's like, Mike, he hates everything. And then, like, somebody just comes to his first day. It's like, this guy never met a setup he didn't like. Well, it's this is the market we're in. And, you know, check back off that if we keep pulling back into these ranges, then I'm going to be a little, uh, I'm going to be back to being Mikey. Yeah, that looks good uh, on a pullback, though. you got to wait for a pullback, obviously. CRK for Andre, CRK, is that Crown Cork and Seal? used to be. Uh, that's an oil stock. Let it, let it keep breaking out and then let it break out and then look to play a pullback, okay? But, yeah, it looks good as far as the possible breakout. I'm not a breakout trader, as you know. Susan wants to know about Q. Welcome, Susan. Is that the Susan that normally comes to these shows, or is that a new Susan? Uh, no, this um, I do not like this one because it's kind of wide and loose. Same old Susan. All right, well, welcome aboard. <laughs> Susan threw me one time. She said she has dreams about me. That's pretty scary. Poor, poor Susan having those nightmares. Um, no, this is kind of all over the place. It's sideways. There's nothing. To, there's nothing to do here. Good to see you back, Susan. Uh, MPET for Andre, M-P-E-T. Uh, no. Come on, Andre. Am I going to, you know, I'm fly back to New York and beat you up. Which I'll be there in February. So if I see you, I'll slap you in the head. Remind me to slap you in the head on that one. <laughs> um. This would shape it up. It's got some problems longer term. I guess that'd be a good problem to have if you got all the way to 15. Eh, I just don't like the longer term action here. I think I'd pass. It's also kind of wide and loose and all over the place. So uh, I think you could find something better in energies. MTL, we talked about that one. Uh, MTL is one that, uh, that's kind of the fish that got away. That was one that we had on our radar. It just didn't have quite enough pullback back here. You know, and that's sometimes being a perfectionist gets in your way, but... I'm not a perfectionist in life. I'm glad you guys – I'm hesitant to turn on my webcam because I'm afraid it might fall over and you'd see what this office looks like. It's, a, as they say in Italiano, disastro. I need to clean this place. But I, mean, I am a perfectionist when it comes to uh, the setups. That's someone asked, asked me if I was a perfectionist. I'm like, well, what would give you that clue just because of the the way I am when it comes to charts. But but in, in real life, I'm kind of a mess. Um Getting back to the stock, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. A few too many days in the pullback. It looks okay. Uh, it looks okay. I think you could do far worse than this. Uh, just a little bit too many days in the pullback, but it's okay. It's I can't really pick it apart too much. TTD for Mr. Jim. Good to see you, Jim. A lot of um, locals today. Uh, no, it's a little too sideways, okay? This would actually have to break out the new highs or at least get well above 31 for me to get excited about it. A-S-I-X. A-S-I-X. Uh, it's okay. Um, ideally, i like to see it clear these prior highs in here, but it's okay. Maybe a little bit deeper pullback. If this were a more established stock versus an IPO, I would say it would have to be well clear of these highs, but IPOs sometimes can have a little bit uh, different patterns. Uh, it's okay. Uh, maybe there's the if you had the course, uh, you could trade the breakout pattern with this one. I think that'd be okay. A R E X. Did we talk about that one? That's going to be 
oil field maybe? Yeah, uh, again, you know, I'm going to have to slap you in the head in February if you're at Traders Expo. Put it on your radar, but wait for it to break out, okay? You could find something else in oil, I promise you. WFM. Oops. Whole paycheck. Um, no, it's too much of an electric cardiogram. I mean, I hear you. It looks okay right here because it took off and pulled back, but it's just an electric cardiogram. If you could hear that beep, beep, beep when you look at a chart, then it's uh, it's not worth uh, trading. H and R, did we talk about that one? Yeah, that's a slap you in the head, right? No, that's a little bit better. Let's see. Yeah, no, we talked about that one. Um, what else? CCJ, that's going to be a uranium stock, I think. Uh, can we go? Uh, well, it looks okay, but it has a lot of overhead supply. It looks like I drew it in from weeks past. So I think I would pass on that one. I hear you, though. I made a bow tie back here. It looks like I got it drawn in. Uh, let's see. Lo and behold, bam, bow tie. Uh, triggered a bow tie here. Nice little move so far. Uh, you know, as I often say, maybe that's a good problem to have. If you come up to, uh, if you got all the way back up to 12, that'd be great. But for me, I think I'd pass based on the overhead supply. AMRS, we're almost done here. AMRS, get your last picks in now. Uh, this one's kind of, well, it's low priced, obviously. It's a little choppy, but it has improved as of late. Let's take a look at a blank chart. Uh, no, too many days in its pullback. So your pullback would start here. Just too many days. I think I would pass. If you're long, stay long, but make sure you have a stop in place. I guess an 80 cent stop would probably work on that one. Andrew, welcome, Andrew. NVGS. NVGS. Yeah, this looks kind of interesting. Um, obviously, it's already broken out today. Uh, let's see what we have here. Uh, we got a bow tie here. So, yeah, it looks okay. It looks like I didn't like it as much about a week ago or so, but it's looking pretty good. Unfortunately, though, it's breaking out today, so I wouldn't rush out and buy it today. Uh, what I would do, though, is maybe on follow-through and a pullback. It might be worth a shot. MBII, MBII. And we'll do last call here in just one minute. Uh, too thin. This is too thin. Uh, who asked about that? Andre? Yeah, it's a little too thin to trade, so I would pass on that. Uh, let's take a look at the chart itself. Eh, just can't get really excited about it. Too many days in the pullback. If you're long, stay long, but really thin trade, so be careful with that one. All right, let me go ahead and do a last call. Um, any last symbols? Pete Brune. Do not see TKO knockout video on your website under videos. Where else might it be? Okay, um, Go to the home page. This is a new this is a content that I did for somebody else and I'm proud of it. It's very professional. The banner ad right now, it's under best chart setups for success or right here. Okay. They do make you jump through some hoops to get to it. That's just typical with, with uh these third parties that that uh promote other websites and other things. But um you can unsubscribe if you get subscribed to something you don't want. But do check it out. It's a really good video and it's a really good uh I haven't looked at the other content there, but Larry McMillan is also in this ebook, and I have the utmost respect for Larry. I'm going to be seeing him uh, in a few, couple of months here in, at Traders Expo. He's a good guy. So I'm looking forward to reading what he has. And so there's a lot of good stuff. It, it amazes me how much free stuff is out there. Of course, they want your email. And of course, they want to try to sell you something. I mean, that's, the, that's how the game works, I suppose. But it amazes me how much free good stuff there is out there. Not everything is good that's free. But I know my contribution is good. I know Larry's going to have something good in there. I've never gotten anything bad from Larry. It's amazing. I wish if if I wish this was like this 30 years ago. And, and you people who are newer to trading, you have no idea how lucky you are. Yes, you're going to get some spam email, and they're going to bug you on some of these things. But it's so worth it just to get the information. And it, I'm just amazed at how much information is now out there that you can get for free. So. Do check it out. Uh, big fan. Okay, Tusk and Vive, and those will be the last two. Tusk, T-U-S-K. Uh, maybe on a pullback. Uh, this was a uh, breakout pattern here, a breakout IPO pattern, and that breakout has already happened. But on a pullback, absolutely keep that one on your watch list. See, again, it's like uh, this guy never found a setup he didn't like. <laughs> Vive, Vive, V. 
VEV, last call once again. Yeah, on a pullback, this looks really good. Uh, in fact, well, there's your TKO right there. Uh, yeah, that's a good way to uh, to end the show. Uh, yeah, that looks good. Um, you know, I'm not a huge – it's just this one gap up and just a couple days of trading. I'd like to see a little bit more follow-through than this. But the fact that you got such a strong sell-off here, a nice little TKO move, I think it could be worth a shot. So absolutely, great way to end the show. All right, um, again – I don't know if I thank you or not, but I do want to thank you for being here. Uh, this is a highlight of my week. I love doing these shows. I have a blast, as you can tell. I'm humbled that you guys would and girls would uh, would show up and listen to me. So thank you so much. Anything unanswered, DaveDaveLandry.com. If it it's an answer that requires a lot of thought, I'll simply make it fodder for next week's show. And I'm always looking for ideas for a show. So feel free to shoot me uh, questions, ideas, etc. Uh, if we don't talk between now and the weekend, everybody have a great weekend, and then hopefully we'll see all you guys and girls again next week. Thank you so much.